Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I am Scott Bernstein, your host, along with my co-host and partner in crime, the doctor, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. And we got Ben behind the glass, our producer. And uh, today we are we got a big episode in store. Uh, there is a a bombshell, a uh, um, a blockbuster news story broke uh, in Chicago over the last couple of days. Uh, and we're going to break it down. We're going to go into the Cicero crew of the Chicago mafia, and we're going to talk about the chaos that has erupted uh, over the last 48 hours. And it, it's um, regarding the death of a, a OG. I mean, this guy's his OG as OG comes uh, on the streets of Chicago. James, Jimmy, I, I and Dino uh, was the face of the Cicero crew, which is a, a historic mob regime that dates all the way back to Al Capone. Uh, the Capone gang pushed into uh, Cicero during Prohibition, and there's, it's been a major uh, cog of the outfit, you know, dating back 100 years. Jimmy Iandino uh, made his name in the 70s as a member of uh, the Cicero crew's quote-unquote wild bunch, which is a very notorious enforcement unit uh, hit squad. Uh, he was a famous hijacker that fought on the front lines of the so-called chop shop wars. Pretty bloody. Right? Uh, this guy is, w w was, you know, went through the grinder and, and still died a free man uh, surrounded by his family. He was eight years old, died of cancer last Thursday. And for about 72 hours, there was nothing but an outpouring of, uh, at least from the people in his orbit, I'm sure that, uh, you know, victims of his or family's victims were weren't saying the same thing. Uh, I, I'd be remiss to not say that the federal government believes that Jimmy Iandino, although he's never been convicted of any uh, mob violence, uh, the, the FBI, Uncle Sam, believes that he is a multiple time uh, murderer, that he was probably involved in dare I say, a dozen, if not more gangland slains, according to the government. Um, and there was an outpouring of love and uh, just reverence from people on the street the last 72 hours. His wake was on Monday. I heard there were hundreds of people that, that lined up to pay their respects at his casket. And literally, as the wake is going on, ABC Chicago Television uh, drops a bomb and reports that they have got the... Uh, Proof, quote unquote, they have a document that was leaked to them. I believe strongly that it was leaked from the FBI, uh, a federal document that uh, dates back to the late 70s and names Einan Dino as a informant for the FBI. They cite two instances, once in the 60s and once in the 70s. The report was uh, filed when Einan Dino was in the middle of serving a 10 year prison sentence. So that kind of flies in the face of his informant status. It didn't help him. It didn't seem to help. Him, right. What you're saying. He ended up doing 20 years. I mean, after these reports or after this one document was drafted, I believe it was drafted in 1979 or 1980. Um, Jimmy Einan Dino did 20 years in prison. So it kind of uh, undermines the narrative that he was giving people up to, to save himself. Anyway, the narrative has completely changed in the last 72 hours. It went from this kind of outpouring of love and reverence to a lot of people calling him a rat, a lot of people um, voicing their displeasure or disappointment. Uh, this, I'm going to throw it back to Jimmy and then we can start dissecting it together. Uh, whether or not it's true or not, I think there's a lot to unpack here. And I think there's a lot of context that's been lost in some of the headlines but uh, I don't agree with the etiquette on behalf of the FBI, frankly, or Channel 7. I, I'm a big fan of Chuck Gowdy. Uh, he's the, the guy who reported. He's the top mob reporter in Chicago for the last 35, 40 years. He's a Hall of Famer. And, and, I, and, and I'm not questioning his reporting of this. He needed to report this. It's newsworthy. Um, I... I question the timing of it because the document is so old. If this document was saying that Jimmy I was informing up until 2020, then I think it would be relevant to put out right after he died. But it seems like, A, I wonder what the motive of the FBI was other than to shit on Jimmy's grave. 
And it, again, I, I, I'm not going to hold a grudge against Chuck. I'm not going to tell any reporter how to do their job. But if it was me, I would have probably held off a week until I reported that. And then within the reporting, it, it seemed like they wanted to make that jump from there was a document that we found that says that Ein and Dino reported in, or uh, informed in 1965 and then again in 1974. But in some of the reporting that's come out in the last 24 hours, the reporters want to make the jump. Well, that means he's been reporting this whole time. He, sorry, he's been informing this whole time. And I don't know if that's a proper jump to be, to be made. Well, let me, uh, first of all, I'll acknowledge that I've been looking at my phone um, at a story about this case study, Jimmy I. So I've noticed that in the past, there have been people commenting that you and I are rude for looking at our phones and looking, I'm looking at my laptop when we're talking, but we're not, we're, it's because we're looking up right, information right. We're, in real we're time. looking at ourselves related to the, <laughs> it's to not the show. that we're not paying attention yeah. to each other and to the guest, but that we're looking up information related to, and sometimes things are coming in in real time. So if any people are watching the show, don't think I was being rude to my uh, esteemed co-host here. Um, yeah, this is, this is a big story. So if we look at the actual uh, document, it says, Specifically, from March 65 until May 1969, which is a long time. Yeah. And then from May 1974 through March 75, and that he was furnishing FBI. This is from the ABC report. He was furnishing FBI information about truck cargo thefts. So let me, let me ask you something here. Let's, let's start unpacking it from the beginning. Information about truck cargo thefts, providing information about that, doesn't necessarily mean that's information about LCN. Right. So what do we think about that? Does that matter? Well, I think there's in the also, underworld? In terms because of, we know there's some people that right. that matters and other people are like, it don't matter. Informing is informing. Informing is informing, right. right. Um, and then there's disinformation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Where sometimes I know there have been yeah. situations where mobsters have actually like greenlit their, um, their subordinates to give information to the government, but it instructed them to give them false information. Right. Yeah. Uh, sure. So I think that there's also, you know, further context that needs to be thrown out there in terms of the way that uh, this information, this type of information was disseminated into official federal documentation at one point and then how it's disseminated into official uh, government documentation now. Back in the 60s and 70s, uh, the drafting of 302s was, was a little bit different. Uh, you were encouraged basically as an, as an FBI agent to put anything and everything into 302s. You were kind of fast and loose with some of the terminology. Guys that, at least this is in my research, guys that maybe didn't agree to be dubbed a confidential informant are being dubbed a confidential informant in the documentation because the FBI agent that's drafting that knows that the more CIs yeah, he collects, looks good. the more 302s he files, the faster he rises up the ladder. Um, so from what I understand the protocol, when, when guys were wrangled by the FBI, not necessarily arrested and not necessarily indicted, but brought down to headquarters uh, for questioning. Anything that was said in those meetings was, would, made its, would make its way into a 302. Um, so if you didn't immediately just tell the person that was bringing you in there, I'm not going to say one word to you without my attorney, which is a smart thing to do. <laughs> but if you didn't do that, anything you said, whether it was like what you had for lunch today, who you drove with to the bowling alley yesterday makes its way into a 302. So I don't know. We saw this also a couple of years ago, remember, with Carmine Persico. You're right. I thought the same thing, yeah. Um, where you have these very <laughs> distinguished underworld figures with these reputations that are almost godlike in terms of their um, posture towards the government. And then some documentation comes out that, that throws that, I guess, that narrative uh, into question. So I don't know what, what exactly that means. Is it possible that Jimmy I was an, 
was feeding information to the FBI in the 60s and 70s? Yeah, it is. Is it possible that he was a confidential informant in, in the way that we view what a confidential informant is today? Yes, I acknowledge that is possible. But I don't look at this one document in a vacuum, knowing what I know as some indicator that Jimmy I has been a rat for 50 years and that is some, something that I've heard recently uh, said from uh, someone of quite a bit of stature uh, that, you know, well, it turns out this whole time Jimmy I was just Whitey Bulger. And I don't yeah, I don't think extreme. that's fair. Yeah, it's pretty extreme, at least at this job. At this right. It's way too early, I think. So let me let me go back to and let you you give both sides to this because I think it's interesting. Give the side the person that says, "Hey, okay, maybe he did, but it wasn't against LCN." So who gives a shit? And then the side that says, "No, you don't talk, you don't talk." It's a universal. So give both sides of those because you've heard both. Yeah, and I don't think it's black and white, and I think there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle because we, again, we've talked about this. Before, uh, we've definitely talked about it privately. I, I'm pretty sure I've, I've said it on the, on the podcast, and I'll say it again. I've been reporting and researching on this world now for uh, going on almost two decades. I think it's 18 years. Um, and one of my biggest takeaways is that almost everybody cooperates or informs on one level or another. Now, if that means simply like we talked about uh, on an episode recently uh, about the bikers and a biker boss kind of getting maybe a little loose lipped with an ATF agent that he saw all the time. Right. And was he cooperating? Was he a CI or was he just being too casual yeah. with, with an FBI agent right, or, yeah. D, or ATF agent? So <laughs> I, just, I just think that there are degrees. And again, I believe that most likely everybody that operates in this world has had conversations with law enforcement over their career that they would never want to be made public. But I don't think that necessarily makes them a rat in the way people define what a rat is. So to answer your question, you know, the first uh, approach would be, you know, if a, if a, and I've actually been somewhere where two mobsters were debating, debating yeah. this yeah. when there was a guy that was coming out of prison who had cooperated against non LCN. And you had one guy saying he didn't, he could have given us all up. He didn't give any of us up. He gave up a black guy. I don't got a problem with it. And then another guy said, I don't care who he gave up. If he gave up a black guy, he could give us, give us up next. Yeah. Right. So I think the, the first line of thinking would be, yeah, he probably was, or, if he was informing, he wasn't giving any information on the Cicero crew or at that time, the administration of uh, Tony Accardo, Sam Giancana, Joey Ayupa, uh, that he was feeding information on guys that were involved in hijacking trucks and stealing cars that had nothing to do with LCN. And yeah. in some ways, possibly, I mean, if we look at that information that he was alleged to be giving in the 70s. It could have been a situation that was in the middle of the chop shop wars where the outfits trying to absorb the stolen car racket and push all these independent guys out. Mm -hmm. um, who knows that someone didn't tell Jimmy, I go to the feds and yeah. give them information, That's, all these independent guys so we can get them out of the way. It's a way to neutralize them yeah. without killing them. Yeah. And then the other argument would just be, you know, that I don't care who he's talking about. If he's having conversations with the government, he's an informant. Yeah, and by the way, that example, I just talked about two, two examples about this in class today. Back during Prohibition, you had bootlegging gangs who would snitch on rival bootlegging gangs to customs so they could <laughs> neutralize your competition. And it goes on now with the drug cartels. They snitch on each other to, so that DEA can make a bust at the border. And then they like it because they can say, hey, look, we're doing our job. And then you neutralize your competition. So I don't know if that's what he did here, but it's a reasonable theory yeah. or hypothesis that maybe that was, if you look at the context of the timing of this. And I think here's my biggest it issue. It doesn't seem uh, a coincidence that it, this it's is right my in the middle of that. This is my biggest issue. And I'm calling out the FBI on this. Um, so 
they obviously had an issue with the the way that Jimmy I was being mourned. This is again, this is my opinion. There was a lot of people, there were a lot of people on social media. Uh, there was a lot of talk online about what a true stand-up guy Jimmy I was, uh, the last of the Mohicans, the dying breed, so forth and so forth. Salt of the earth. Right. This <laughs> did not sit well with the FBI, in my belief. I don't know for sure that they leaked that document to Chuck, but my best guess tells me that they leaked that document to Chuck. They leaked it so it would be reported on the day of his wake to besmirch his reputation, to destroy his legacy. Um, and doesn't and that, isn't that useful to, to demoralize yeah. the guys who are still on the yeah, street? Yes. But I, and I understand that some of this is inside baseball, but I'm, I'm going to, I know our audience like inside baseball. So maybe people that were outside our outside our audience can't understand this, but I think our audience understands this. So, where were these 302 leaks in 2018 when Johnny Nono's DeFranzo passed away? Johnny Nono's DeFranzo, in my opinion, based on my research, I have zero qualms saying that I believe firmly that Johnny Nono's DeFranzo, while being the godfather of the Chicago Mafia for 30 years, was also a top echelon confidential informant. Um, he was implicated in more than one very, very high-profile mob assassination um, at the Family Secrets trial, not just for taking part in it, but for coordinating it uh, for three separate homicides. But he wasn't indicted in Family Secrets. There were rumors that there was going to be a Family Secrets 2, which would then hold DeFranzo and his inner circle accountable for those murders. It never came. DeFranzo was convicted in a racketeering case uh, that that held up for about 18 months and then got tossed out. And in Johnny DeFranzo's pretty much his whole career as a mob shot caller, he did 18 months in prison. He got uber wealthy, not like gangster wealthy, but like, you know, corporate CEO wealthy. And in my opinion, he had a license to kill and a license to do whatever he wanted to from the feds as long as he fed them bus. And I think the bus that, in my opinion, Johnny No Nose was feeding them wasn't just mob bus. He was someone that was so connected into the legitimate white collar world. I think he was feeding the government those kind of bus too. Um, I just, I don't know if Jimmy I was an informant. I, I'm open to the possibility. I'm definitely open to the possibility that he, he was giving information in the 60s and 70s. There's zero proof that he was giving any information after 75. Um, but for the FBI to roll this out the day of Einan Dino's funeral, but to stay quiet after Johnny No Nose DeFranzo died, I just think that is just like the, the epitome of hypocrisy. And it's like they, had a, they were okay with DeFranzo being a murderer because he gave them all these busts. So we're going to protect his legacy. We're not going to confirm anything. But for Jimmy I, for whatever reason, someone had a vendetta against him whether or not he gave information or not. And they wanted to, you know, squat down and take a giant dump on Jimmy's grave, his wake, his funeral, his legacy, his reputation. I just, that's the part that I have a hard time reconciling. We know for sure. And I know that someone pushed back and say, we don't know for sure, but I know for sure. Johnny DeFranzo was a confidential informant. Well, uh, the obvious Question here is, uh, have you seen paperwork on that? Is there paperwork on that? I have not seen paperwork, but I've heard from enough people that are confidential informants that know about other confidential informants mm. that DeFranzo was a confidential informant. I know people that were at police departments and FBI uh, bureaus as cooperators in rooms with Johnny DeFranzo as a cooperator. Wow. Is it possible someone uh, texted me earlier and said it's possible that I guess at this point anything's possible, but that this was an old school FBI agent who had this document. Yeah, it's possible. Who leaked it. So in yes. other words, not the office, yes. not, not the Chicago office, but a specific yeah. agent that had a hard on for yes. Jimmy I that leaked this. Yeah. That's plausible. Too? Yeah, of course. I do believe that it's possible. Would, would that change your narrative about the Chicago office? 
I mean, to an extent, I guess. But it doesn't excuse their defronzo, right? Uh, giving him a pass, but um, I just think there's so there's so much context lost in this, and then everybody it, it seems wants to make the jump that this is definitive proof that he's been informing for the last forty five years, but he's done twenty years in prison. What I said in the, the piece I wrote today on my website was if it's true, you know, <laughs> before he died, he should have gone and asked for those 18 years back. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, that is a, a it is an interesting point here that if he was um, if he was that prolific of an informant, he didn't really get much in return. He could have gotten, it. you know, if, if you would have told me he got sentenced to 25, but he ended up doing six. OK, then those are breaks. Yeah. But in both cases, he did the max. Yeah, he did from 78 to 88. He was locked up for for hijacking because that yeah. was his specialty, uh, hijacking trucks, just like you see the movie Goodfellas. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then he got busted in 2001 in a big uh, racketeering political corruption case out of Cicero, where the mayor of Cicero and several uh, municipal employees were uh, in a, a stealing and laundering money and jimmy i was helping them launder money and taking kickbacks and taking tribute checks or sorry tribute uh, envelopes and uh, he had to go away at that point for another eight years and if if we accept the hypothesis that defranzo was cooperating th that could have been the kind of examples of people he would give up political corruption you're saying yeah. not not just gangster shit but like i'm just saying in my my reporting and my research cooperators have Punishments that don't fit the crime. They do things that should result in 30 year sentences and they get two year sentences or three year sentences. Yeah. And guys that are not cooperating are getting slammed. Yeah. And, and the only other way to explain that would be like paying the judge off or something. Right. Right. Because it, it just doesn't comport with right. the other evidence. So I, I'm also interested in this idea of demoralizing the, the rank and file is is there a case that can be made okay let's say he never talked to anyone in the fbi after 74 he never gave up any italians or lcn can you still take on the street someone take this hard line approach like i don't give a fuck he should have never talked to anyone i don't care if it was fucking 1969 and he didn't give up do you do you expect that could be the case that there could be some guys on the street right now in chicago that are really upset about this even if it turns out best case scenario yeah. <laughs> that it was yeah. sort of just a casual thing. He yes. leaked some info about some non-Italian dudes back, way back in the day, but there still could be some dudes who are like, this is, no, he this was is a universal old, ban right. on doing that shit. And you did it. Yeah. I mean, I can see that, uh, that way of thinking. And uh, I'm not telling anyone how to think, you yeah. know, however you want to define an informant. I'm saying from what I know and put it into the context of all of my research, 99.9% .9 of everybody cooperates to a degree. So to me, taking that it's true, assuming that it's true, that he was opened as a confidential informant and gave some information in the 60s and gave some information in the 70s, it doesn't change my opinion of Jimmy I as a, what his legacy as a Chicago outfit figure is. I look at it as just kind of par for the course and he was probably hedging his bets and playing the disinformation game while trying to mitigate any future busts. But did it mitigate any future busts when he got jammed up for hijacking trucks in 1977 or whatever? Did they give him a break? No, they gave him 10 years. He missed the entire 1980s. He missed the entire Reagan administration. <laughs> did, um, so uh, was he a made guy back in 69? So I, I, I've heard some different things today. Um, Personally, I think everybody in the Wild Bunch was made. Um, they were all guys that fell underneath Joe Ferriola, who was the Cicero Capo at that point, eventually became a boss of the outfit or front boss for the outfit for, for a period of time in the 80s. I would guess he was probably made in the 70s, but if he hadn't have been made in the 70s, he would have been made in that time period um, from when he got out in 88, I would say somewhere between 88 and 92. So Salvatore De Laurentiis, who is allegedly the godfather of the Chicago Mafia today, uh, has been bossed for uh, going on a dozen plus years. There is um, federal 
documentation of his making ceremony. We know that he was made uh, in 1988. So I would guess if Ein and Dino hadn't been made when he got out of prison in 88, he was made very quickly thereafter. Does that change the, the street view of... I didn't think about this. that. I mean, because he hadn't taken an oath yet. Right, right. That's what I mean. I think Chicago's different. I mean, their their making procedures are different. The protocol's different. Um, when they they, they don't it, even know. they don't even use a, a <laughs> the gun knife. Yeah, right. From the either this means something or don't. <laughs> um. So, I uh, I think in Chicago it doesn't mean as much. There are a lot of guys that I know that got ma- or according to the FBI, according to documentation from informants, guys that got made in the 80s that had been doing some pretty major things in the 60s and 70s. So like they were being treated as a made guy before they got made. Yeah. And that's not normal. Mostly until you get your button, sure. you're going to be treated like someone that doesn't have a button. Sure. I think in Chicago and Detroit, it can be a little bit different. Yeah. You've even got. Like non Italian guys right. who who are treated with really a lot of stature in both of those fans, and both of those right fans. right and and they'll and those guys will never get their button. It's not yeah. possible, and they're they're treated with because people know that when they speak, it's on behalf of of a high ranking LCN guy, and that they're earners. I mean, <laughs> any earners. any guy like yeah. that that has that uh, stature as a non made guy is a major earner. Yeah, always. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that go that goes along with. So that. I just I I don't like the timing of this. I think there's a lot of context being lost and it's going to come off like I'm politicking or advocating for someone that I believe is a multiple time killer, but I'm trying to look at this through the context of our reporting. This is just, this is the world that we live in. These are the kind of people that we talk about and report on. And I'm not trying to dismiss the fact that he probably left a lot of people uh, you know, mentally broken over the fact that they lost their loved ones if he was involved in any homicides. Uh, I have a hard time believing that he was a core member of the Wild Bunch, which was a suspect in two dozen or so murders, and he yeah. didn't have some role in some of those. Yeah, they had a violent reputation. Uh, so and was, he the, was he a captain until the day he died of Cicero? What was so his, he was, was he capo, he captain? was underboss. Or underboss. He was the number two man in the whole outfit, I would say, for the last decade. Oh, that well, okay, yes. I, I don't know a lot uh, about Chicago. He got out of prison in 08, became a capo of Cicero, that was at the same time that Mike Sarno, who we'll get to in a second, um, when we're talking about, we're going to talk about the new generation of the outfit coming up uh, from Cicero, guys that were mentored by Jimmy Iandino uh, and, and guys like Mike Sarno, who was the boss of the outfit from 2005 till 2010. He was the acting boss. And uh, Iandino came out in 08. Sarno went to prison in 10. So at some point between 8 and 10, Einandino became capo of, of Cicero. And then at some point between 10 and 14, he became Sally D's underboss. Okay. So I, I didn't realize that he was, um, that he was that, he was that high ranking. So um, are you at liberty to say what your outfit contacts are? Yeah, what, what so their, what their impression is of this? I've gotten a, you know, I I don't want to say a mixed bag. I've got a lot of people that are questioning again, you know, the context of this, um, what it means to have shown up in those documents at that time. Yeah, is it a definitive um, declaration of him being a cooperator, or was it him sitting in a, you know, being called downtown to FBI headquarters ten times? And engaging with them in, in a back and forth, does that mean that you're, I mean, th- that's another layer of this. Does that mean that you're an informant? Because you're having a conversation across a table uh, with people that are saying, we're not going to arrest you, we're not, doing, we're not going to indict you, but we want to ask you some questions. Yeah. Um, remember Boss of Bosses, there was that one Gambino guy, those FBI guys, they would talk to him all the time, have yeah. these casual conversations over coffee. Right. He wasn't an, I don't think he was an official CI, but he just, he knew him. Yeah. He saw him all the time because they were, they were trailing him all the time and he would shoot the shit with them. Um, so is it possible? I, I Again, I, obviously anything's possible, but I'm saying from your perspective as an expert on Chicago and as an investigative reporter, 
is it possible that this is the tip of the iceberg? And that for we'll whatever see. reason, this is all, who, let's say someone had a heart on for him and put it out there. But actually, this could have been a continuing relationship. And we just, the paperwork hasn't but come to, out But yet. to me, it's like if someone. So then what did he get for it, right? That would be like. But no, but also, if, if that was the narrative you wanted to put out there, then you should have dropped it. If you had it, I guess. You sure. should have dropped a document that says, oh, he's been cooperating since he's been out of prison yeah. on both the hijacking case and the political corruption case. And when he's been the capo of Cicero and when he's been the underboss of the Chicago mafia, he's been giving us information. But yeah. that didn't come out. What came out is a internal document from 1979, I believe. That states that he had given information at some point in the 60s and 70s. And again, we don't know exactly what that means. On its face, it looks like he was a confidential informant. Yeah. But I, I know the way these things are done, and I don't take that on its face. So anything's possible, but in your opinion, unlikely. I don't think that, it's unlikely that I don't think it's unlikely that he was giving information. No, I mean like after 70. Oh, I yes. I not impossible, but I unlikely. find it difficult to believe that he's been a CI the last 30 years That's or 40 I mean. yeah, years. Okay. I'm not going to dismiss it, sure. but I find it difficult to believe. So you asked me, what am I hearing? So I'm, the first group of people are, are doing the, this is impossible. Jimmy, I uh, was a stand-up guy. He might've had some you know, conversations where he got loose lipped and said some stuff that maybe he wouldn't want to, to become public, but was never giving up his friends or his superiors in the outfit. But I've also gotten a couple people, and these are people that I know are in the know, and people that are around some of the top guys. And this, you know, I, we're not overstating the fact that this was a nuclear missile that <laughs> hit Cicero yesterday, that there are people that Jimmy I was very close with that are now of the belief that he was giving them up to the government this whole time. And so is it safe to say that they're talking with each other? Like, who do you yes. think he gave, who do you yes. think he gave up? And wondering if there's going to be busts that are coming down the pike now because he's dead. Wondering if previous busts that, you know, who certain people were giving information, maybe those people you can trace back to Jimmy. I, I mean, the only thing in my head, 2008, but Again, it's, the timeline doesn't make sense. Iandino's come out of prison in 08, and the Cicero, part of the Cicero crew was brought down in 08. But, so Jimmy would have been given information while he was a guest of the federal government? He wasn't on the street at that time? Mm -hmm. That seems unlikely to me. Because he wouldn't have been in the know? Because He, he might have been in the know, but he's in prison. It's a lot different. I mean, yeah. And if I was Jimmy I and someone came to me in the middle of my sentence and said, we want you to give us information, I'd be like, OK, I'll give me information. If the FBI came to him in 2004, three years into a sentence and said, we want you to start giving us some information on Mikey Sarno, who's about to become boss. If you're Jimmy I and Dino, don't you say, OK, fine. If, if you were inclined to do that, let me out of prison. Of course. Right. That, that's, a, that's some pretty compelling evidence, I think, for your position is that. If he if he were cooperating, he didn't really have much to show for it <laughs> in terms of like. And then the one bust in the last 20 years that you could possibly tie him to is the Cicero bust. But again, the bust came down. Well, all the stuff that happened during the bust, Jimmy was locked up. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty extreme for some people on social media. I think talk, saying this is the Chicago Whitey Bulger. Pretty extreme. Yeah. Comparison. But if you're just consuming the headlines. And you don't know this context that I'm trying to provide, that we're trying to provide. You don't know the way that uh, FBI protocol has changed over the years. You don't know, you know, you're looking at everything in a vacuum. I can understand why people would be saying that. Yeah. Well, especially if you have um, a cursory knowledge of this world and you think Omerta is like, yeah, that's the way it works. Um, then you see this and you think, oh, he must have been a snitch and oh my God. So when, when there are a lot of nuances, it seems. I, 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 don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a horse in this race. I, I don't, yeah, I don't know enough about I, Chicago, but I, I think it definitely, it's definitely interesting. I just think it's a little bit irresponsible. And I'm not going to call it any specific reporter, but some of the media reports, they're just, they're making this jump 
that just because there's this documentation from the 60s and 70s, well, that automatically means that everybody in the Chicago mob right now needs to be nervous that stuff that he's been in their, in, in this narrative's mind, giving information to the feds this whole time or the last 10, 15 years, and that now there's going to be cases coming down the pike because of information they gleaned from mine and Dino. And that is just pure speculation of the, uh, you know, at the, at the utmost level, there's, there's nothing to lead us to believe right now yeah. that there was any more cooperation yeah. than that we saw in that document. And why would the feds wait until he died? If they, if they really had all the goods, why would they wait until, right? Yeah. Wouldn't they strike if, if, it was, if there was enough intel there, they would, it seems like they would have struck. I, th- I think some of these issues that we're talking about are going to uh, segue us into the talk of, you know, who, who's on deck because there's a situation within that conversation of what's cooperation and what constitutes a, a proper pun- punishment for that, uh, uh, for, for that cooperation. So uh, I reported, I've been reporting the last five, six years that Mike Sarno, who was uh, from the Cicero crew, who was the acting boss of the outfit uh, from 2005 to 2010, that he was concerned about the future of the Chicago mob, uh, him and his number two, Sammy Cotadella, who I'm told has replaced Jimmy Einandino as the official underboss. He was acting underboss. Um, I believe Sammy uh, they call him Sammy Cards. Sammy Cards is now the number two guy in the outfit. Uh, but that Sammy Cards and Fat Mike Sarno, when they took power in 05, they made it a priority to focus uh, cultivating a younger generation of mentoring younger guys, bringing the outfit into the 21st century with guys that were tech savvy guys that knew white collar crime, not just hijackers, right? Not just hijackers, thieves and hitmen, <laughs> um, and bookies and loan sharks, you yeah. know, diversification and that they hand selected anywhere between 20 and 30 guys who in the two thousands were in their late twenties and thirties. Um, and made them in ceremonies that were kind of, Cicero ceremonies from everything I've been told about this, that this was a Cicero thing. This wasn't really an outfit thing. And that these, let's say 30 guys are more loyal to Sarno, Einandino, Catadella, Sally D and Cicero than they are to the overall uh, welfare of the outfit. That, but, but that was the leadership at the time of the overall outfit, right? Yes. Mike Sarno was the boss. So, does that only matter if someone from a different crew becomes the boss? Well, now the power, if you know what I mean. Well, so traditionally the power in the outfit was in Cicero, from you know the uh, Sam Giancana days all the way through the late eighties with Joey Ayupa and Joe Feriola. Then the power, because John DeFranzo took over, the power moved to Elmwood Park, and the power had been in Elmwood Park, uh, let's say from nineteen ninety uh, into the two thousand tens. Um, and now it's back in Cicero. Uh, so yes, when those guys were inducted, I guess Elmwood Park was in charge, but Chicago's so, it's such an outlier when it's like when Ocardo was the boss, he really wasn't day to day, the boss, it's the, the boss and whether in he Chicago, didn't even live in Chicago hardly right, for a Canada. while, right? So in Chicago, when you reach the level of boss, you have very little day to day control. So yeah. it's really the acting boss or the street boss is the person that has the power. So even though DeFranzo was the boss and the power was in Elmwood Park from 1990 to 2018, in the 2000s at least, Jimmy Marcello and, and Mike Sarno were running the outfit as the acting boss, street boss. It's similar. We, you know, I like to talk about Detroit. That's our right. That's our backyard. You know, it's similar to Detroit. So like Joe's really Black Bill Toco and Pete Licavoli, all Licavoli in Arizona, and oh, Black Bill and Zerilli in Florida almost all the time. Like, I think hardly a, ever in Detroit. I think the, the Detroit and Chicago families kind of in unison created 
this insulation or this insulation protocol for their bosses that yeah. there would be street bosses and several le- several layers smart of buffers between the guy who's the ultimate shot caller and the streets. Yeah, there's a lot of buffers. Buffer senator. <laughs> Willie G. I, you know, I push a button and uh, <laughs> you know, come on, Senator. Yeah, you know, you know, push a button. Like <laughs> so, uh, the family had a lot of buff, for <laughs> Senator. <laughs> Mike Sarno and Sammy Cotadella, from what I was told, had selected this group of youngsters that are now in their forties and fifties, and that which is young in LCM right. years, and that they're the future. Um, they are the new the new leaders, the new blood of the outfit, that there's been a transition taking place in the last couple of years. Cause uh, I've heard that Solly D as much as you're insulated as boss, he's taken in even you know more steps backwards and is going into semi-retirement. Ein and Dino was, was on the down low battling cancer. Nobody knew it until he died. Uh, DeFranzo and his brother have been gone for the last couple of years. Frankie Caruso over on the, uh, South side is getting older, spending a lot of time out of state, grooming a younger group on the South side as well. Guys that had ties to Cicero and ties to Sarno. And, uh, but the South side still technically distinct from Cicero. Yeah. So, okay. so, uh, Cicero is West suburbs. Okay. Or West side. South side is like Chinatown, 26th street. Then you got the grand Avenue crew, which is kind of near West side, which is the West side kind of by the end of, what you would consider downtown or the right. loop and the further west you get it eventually becomes cicero and the cicero group elmwood park from what i understand uh is either on the verge of being rolled into cicero really or has already been rolled into cicero just because there aren't enough guys over there and it's another thing i mean this is a, a subject for another podcast and we can definitely do this if the audience is interested what's going on in cicero is also kind of unique to itself um with rudy fratto who mm. I'm told is kind of doing his own thing uh, in Cicero with another group of some younger guys that, again, are more loyal to Rudy and Elmwood Park and the DeFranzos than they were to mm. the overall outfit. And that Rudy, is, Rudy Fratto is someone, unlike Jimmy Iandino, who was kind of universally beloved and feared, um, Rudy Fratto is a lightning rod. People either really like him or really hate him. In the outfit. So I've been told that Rudy Fratto is kind of like given some autonomy. He's one of the Franzos guys. Yeah. Uh, and that he's kind of given, he's getting up there in age, um, was a capo, maybe conciliary, no one really knows. But now that he's kind of his own entity within the outfit, I think envelopes still get passed, but nobody really chimes in how, and how he's running that group. But, he's, but he would still kick up to. Yeah. To Jimmy or the, right. Jimmy or Al Bivina, who's the I've heard was the street boss. He's the Grand Avenue capo or, or Solly D. Yeah. Um, as we wrap it up, um, well, this is kind of close. Go back to where we started from with Jimmy. I, you know, we're, I'll throw it out. to I'll throw this to Jimmy and then I'm then I'll maybe give my opinion. You know, <laughs> as of right now, as of, let's say, the first week of March, uh, 2023. Where does Jimmy I's legacy stand and and will it change uh, as more information comes out? Is this going to forever taint um, what people think of this guy that for the last 50 years they saw as this legend's legend? I have a feeling that it will. And the main reason why is the paperwork is there. You know, people speculate on guys. And but I think um, as long as the paperwork is there. There's going to be people that aren't as interested in getting into the details, nuances yeah. and the details and are like, hey, the paperwork is there. That's all I need to know. I don't care when. I don't care why. You're not supposed to do that. So mm-hmm. my guess is it, 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 it is forever changed, fair or not. Uh, I think there's, there's definitely, you know, we're kind of, you've crossed the line now with, with available information that I don't think you'll ever be able to go back from. So in some ways, his legacy is always now going to have this asterisk. But I think some of what the long-term impact of this in terms of his reputation and legacy will come 
if any more information comes out, if, yeah. if they're able, if Chuck Gowdy and people in Chicago are able to follow this stuff up with more, more recent stuff, oh, yeah, sourcing from people that they've trusted that can say this. But if it's just this one thing, and in 10 years from now, we're doing discussion about Jimmy I's legacy. I, for me, I, I don't know what much of a difference it would make. Uh, just because I can't say even taking that at taking that taking it at its giving it as much merit as you can give it what was reported in terms of that document, even if he was a confidential informant for the FBI at certain times in his younger years, younger. I mean, I'm talking about when he's in his tw- in his 20s. And there's no proof that he ever gave information in his 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s. I don't personally uh, that that would play a role in me mitigating that part of his career. I, I, I would say also there's a lot of politics. It doesn't it doesn't sound like the guys coming up were his guys, if I'm not mistaken. Well, they were Sarno's guys, but you got to understand Sarno's been in prison for the last yeah. 13 years, and Einandino has that territory. So Einandino has had to sign from what I forget from my report. Yeah. Has had to sign off on all of these guys that got made when Einandino was locked up. Yeah, in that case, that could also change the um this could get buried kind of if if like the next wave of leadership liked him, it might get buried. If if, if, if nothing else comes out. And the last thing I'll say, I want to clarify something that I reported that was inaccurate. Again, I'm always uh, going to come forth. If I get something wrong, I will always take ownership for it. Um, I reported initially that uh, Sally D uh, was at Jimmy I's wake and funeral to pay his respects. That was bad information. Um, I relied too much on some of the mainstream media outlets that were reporting that, thinking that I didn't need to <laughs> check it out myself, which is you know, a lesson that I, I shouldn't have to learn now. Um, and that was reported because of his signing of a guest book. But when I, when I read it in these media reports, I was assuming I should not have assumed that that meant that there were cameramen or reporters that saw Sally D at the funeral signing said guest book. When in reality, it was a online guest book. Oh, uh, and Sally D is, was not there. I heard Solid he's not even uh, in Illinois right now. He's not even in Chicago right now. I don't want to say where he is. The person who told me said he doesn't want me to say where he is. But uh, Undisclosed location. Right. So I just want to be clear when I reported initially, I was up there for about 12 hours or 13 hours, that uh, Solid D was there kind of leading this Chicago mob diplomatic convoy. <laughs> uh, that's, that's not true. There were a lot of uh, big time outfit players that were there. But Sally D, who's the boss, the alleged godfather of Chicago, uh, was not. So that's the last thing I have to say on it. Please like, subscribe, share. Um, we're going to be, you know, giving you this content every week. We're going to try to give you some additional content as soon as, as humanly possible. I know we've been teasing it. And uh, I promise you by uh, in the very near future, by, by springtime, we'll have more consistent content. We're going to be doing uh, the, the Patreon thing. We're going to be doing the, um, I think we might be doing some crowdsourcing, but uh, we're also going to be selling merch eventually. We're going to be having some lives where you can interact with us think, where maybe I we think can audiences would like that yeah so stay tuned uh we look forward to bringing it to you this was i had a, I had a, a great time on this episode uh sorry we didn't bring you a guest but we felt like this was something that you know the two of us could handle and and uh i guess we'll see you next week uh for for jimmy bucciolato and ben augusta our all-star producer this is scott bernstein og podcast out